Okay, guys, let's get started. Uh, welcome to my session on in vivo prototyping. Uh, my name is Bartek Szopka. Uh, I am a software developer from uh, Poznań in Poland. Uh, and I work at uh, Karyo Technologies with our development team from Pilsen in Czech Republic and uh, marketing and design people from San Jose, in California. And uh, my role for the last couple of months was to work as kind of a bridge between uh, design and development teams. Uh, as I was focusing on prototyping new features for our application. Uh, so in this talk, I'd like to share some of our experiences on prototyping process uh, by answering these questions free. Uh, what is prototyping and what do I mean by in vivo prototyping? Uh, how we are using it in our project and why I think it's important and worth sharing with you. So maybe let's start with a simple definition. Uh, a prototype, as we probably all in common sense know, is a first model of something that is used to showcase new idea or to test it before the other copies of this thing are created. And I guess the industry that uh, is most known for creating prototypes is a car industry because their prototypes really catch the eye because they are used to showcase how the future of car industry may look like. Uh, but prototypes don't need to be as fancy as, and expensive as uh, car prototypes because actually they shouldn't, because they are meant to quick testing and we shouldn't be afraid to throw away prototype if it doesn't work. So for example, this is a prototype of a board game. My brother and his friend was, were designing. And it went through many iterations before they got the rules right, so the game was both challenging and playful. And with this game prototype, we are actually getting closer to software development, because uh, in game development and video game development, prototypes are used very early in the design process to check how, how the game works. So this is a screenshot from Pillars of Eternity game founded on Kickstarter. and. Uh, the benefit of getting the games founded, uh, crowdfunded is that developers share the progress of development. So actually what I've learned is how early they actually used prototypes and they've built prototypes to test how rendering in a game engine would work. They even had some simple prototype to check how characters in the game would interact with opening doors. And they did it very, very early. And in web development field, uh, we rarely use such rich prototypes because uh, in web development, prototyping is something designers, not developers, do in most cases. So we have these paper prototypes that are just the sketches that are used to show to the user how the application flow may look like. They are very cheap, but also they don't really give us the feeling how the application will, will work in the end. Uh, we also have what I call the clickable prototypes that are mostly like static images or wireframes that are bound together so a user can click through them to get a feeling how the application works. But still, these are just static images. It can't be uh, given the real data, for example. So another step in prototyping is actually creating some custom HTML, CSS, and JavaScript-based prototype. But this, uh, on the other hand, requires designer to have some coding skills. And they are not used very often. And all of these prototypes are actually design process artifacts. And uh, when we were thinking about prototyping new features for our application, uh, we wanted to benefit from the fact that we have uh, existing code base. We have UI components we could use. We have styles in CSS that we could reuse in the prototype. And also we have a running application with users, with content, so uh, why not to use it uh, in prototyping? So that's how our process of uh, prototyping inside of the application came out. And I called it in vivo uh, because it's a term coming from Latin that means within the living. It's used mostly in medical studies for the studies performed on living organisms. Uh, 
but I guess uh, it would be best to describe how this in vivo prototyping works on the example. So let me give you a short case study about how we implemented the recent pages feature for, for our application and how we prototyped it. So to give you a context, uh, our same page app is a collaboration tool that users could create uh, pages and share some content files or images on these pages. And we wanted to give users some quick access to pages they visit rec recently or frequently. So the first idea was a concept. Uh, it was actually this static HTML prototype. Uh, one of uh, members of our design, design team did. Uh, so the idea was to have this uh, horizontal line of the screenshots of the pages so a user could quickly scroll, click on the screenshot of the page they recently visited and go to this page. Uh, and I took this, this idea and actually implemented it in our application. So I used some uh, client-based library called HTML to Canvas to render screenshots in the browser. And I used local storage to store these screenshots and the list of recent pages uh, in, in the local storage. So we basically, within a couple of days, were able to check this functionality inside of our application with our content. But uh, this was actually really quick and dirty programming. What I did was making this prototype and putting uh, really non-performant, uh, untested code into our application, right? And deep down in our engineers' hearts, we all feel that that's crap. We shouldn't do things like that, even though it's, it's a prototype, right? So the question right now is, uh, how to actually separate this prototype code from the rest of the application so we could do bug fixes and releases without this prototype there. So the first, the easiest probably solution would be to simply create a separate repository, like a copy of the application or a fork on a GitHub and create the, the prototype in parallel. But on the other hand, if the feature would be successful and we would like to implement it, we would have to copy all the code. So it's not a very good idea. And because we already have a repository, probably the better idea is to create a branch for the prototype. So uh, it's still quite easy to get rid of the prototype if it doesn't work. You simply forget about this branch or delete it from the repository. It's, it's not a problem. Uh, and if you want to improve the feature and include it into the release, you can simply merge it or cherry pick the commits. Uh, but still, we, w we wanted to make it possible for us to actually release the prototype before it's finished with the application to our and deploy it to our live server. Uh, so what we started to do is to actually prototype from the very beginning in the master branch. So all the new unfinished feature were, were there, ready to be released. And we've hidden the prototype behind the feature flag. And can you raise your hand if you know more or less what a feature flag is? Okay, some of you. So a feature flag, or sometimes it's called feature toggle, uh, is a branching point, but not on a repository, but in the code. So for example, in this case, it's just simple conditional statement. Uh, so what it means that this new feature is already in the code, it will get released with this code to the uh, live server, but it will never run until the configuration says that it should be enabled. So from the very beginning, this prototyping feature is basically disabled for, for everyone, and when it gets finished, we can, for example, test it with some group of users. So what feature flags allow us is basically that the prototype finally lives with the application, it's ready to be released with, with the application and deployed on, on the live server, and we have full control with the configuration who will see this prototype. So that's actually what we did. So this prototype was at the very beginning hidden and disabled for everyone. I was only enabling it for myself on the development machine. 
So I could, uh, for example, sh show it during our design calls. So we could iterate, and we decided to do this tile-based uh, design to fit more screenshots on the screen. And when we were satisfied with the design, uh, we wanted to enable it for our early adopters users. These are uh, developers, testers, some product owners inside of our company. So we notified them, here is new prototype, have a look how it works, let us know what you think about it. And basically, one day after that, we had to disable this feature. Uh, it was mostly for the technical reasons. What turns out that uh, this library we used for uh, client-side rendering had some issues. Uh, it didn't understand all of the CSS properties, so there were some glitches, but uh, maybe more importantly, it was basically killing Internet Explorer on some pages, so we couldn't have it enabled for, for the users. But what we've learned from this prototype was, uh, first of all, that this visual kind of navigation uh, worked quite well for the users. It was very nice visual feedback. So if we ever have resources to build maybe server-side screenshot solution using PhantomJS, we could go this way again. And what we discovered is that uh, some keyboard shortcuts made it very easy and quick for the users to navigate between the pages. So that was something we wanted to work with. Uh, so this recent pages idea didn't die with this first prototype. We already had some quick search functionality. So a user could start typing a couple of letters and they got the list of pages that were matching the, the titles. And this seemed like a good place to be enhanced with the recent pages. So we wanted to place the recent pages in this in these search results. And again, uh, after, I guess, one hour brainstorming meeting with the design team, we had an idea how we, we wanted it to look like. And thanks to having this previous prototype, so most of the, of the functionality about storing recent pages was already there, uh, within a day I was able to create a functional prototype that showed the list of recent pages uh, with this search and users could start typing to get both recent pages and some search results from the server. So quite quickly, uh, we again iterated on the design, how we wanted this feature to look like, and we enabled it for all the Curio employees internally. And again, we, we started to gathering feedback from the users, what they think about this feature, is, is it uh, useful for them or not. And uh, again, thanks for, for, from this feedback and thanks for having users testing it on their own content. We found out some issues we didn't see before. For example, some users had pages with the, exactly the same titles but in a different place in the hierarchy and they couldn't see the difference between these pages on, on the list. So we decided to add some more context information uh, about the pages to, to the screen. Uh, we also improved the way uh, how the loading spinner was shown because uh, only thanks to having this prototype running on the live server, we actually seen how long does it take to load all the, all the results. If you make a static HTML prototype, you wouldn't see things like that. Uh, and we also managed to improve the way the keyboard shortcuts worked because uh, having keyboard shortcuts uh, merged with this search field worked really, really well. So basically, we, with a couple of key presses, users were, were able to get the, to the page they wanted, especially if they visited them this page recently. So this was really nice feature users liked. And during this time, when we were getting this feedback from internal users, uh, we were also improving the design and the code itself. So the code got refactored. Uh, it got code reviewed, there were some tests implemented for, for, the, uh, for this feature. Uh, we've implemented some uh, backend API to make the calls more performant. So finally the feature got to the release uh, quality and we released this feature for all of the users of the same page. So uh, 
as you can see, uh, the in vivo prototyping boils down to uh, working very closely between design and development teams to iterate quickly in the early phases of the design. Prototyping inside the existing code so we could reuse the code we already have, some UI components, styles, uh, and build the prototype based on that. And improving or failing quickly. So thanks to prototyping uh, with this crappy code, we were able to get the feedback very quickly and see what things, uh, which things work and which things don't work at all. And maybe the most important thing is really being able to test the prototype with existing data and users because uh, even with the best design team, you can't foresee all the ways users will use this feature. So uh, as you can see from this example, the first idea we had for these recent pages was totally different from the thing we ended up with. And this was only because uh, we had this process. And uh, I really think, and, and the feedback from the user is that uh, at this point, this recent pages feature in this stage we got it is, is really something that uh, is good for them. So uh, as you can see, this in vivo prototyping process worked quite well for us. And I really hope that even if you will not be able to uh, build the similar process for yourself, maybe some aspects of it will be useful for you. Uh, because these concepts are actually nothing new. Uh, for example, feature flags, I guess, were made popular a couple of years ago by uh, developers of, of Flickr. They shared on their development blog how they use them. Uh, also, Facebook uh, is using things like feature flags, canary builds, uh, and they are gradually enabling feature for their users, and they are pushing code twice a day to the production, I, I guess. Also, Google had uh, have quite a similar thing in Gmail. It's called Gmail Labs. I don't know if, if you've seen it. It's a tab in your settings in the Gmail where you actually have some experimental features for you to enable. So what this actually is exposing some of the feature flags to the user. So the user can choose which things they want to uh, have enabled. And they are also getting feedback from the users on that. So that's that's actually making user decide if they want experimental feature or, or not. So more and more companies, especially the companies that build really large products and maintain uh, uh, big web apps with lots of users, uh, see the benefits of releasing features, even uh, not very finished features quite early and getting feedback from, from the users. So uh, if there are some things I would like you to take from this talk is, first of all, uh, that we should all work together, designers and developers. Because I, I've wor worked in a couple of companies, and I always see that uh, design process and development process are seen as two separate parts. They are two separate teams, even two separate departments. Sometimes totally different company does, this, does the design. and. Uh, I guess the best results are achieved when we are working all together because we have the same goal, making our app better for, for our users. So uh, you should really try it. And if you don't already uh, learn more about feature flags and try to find a place for them in, in your projects because uh, they are really powerful things, simple but powerful. They uh, allow you to release features sooner and more often and being safe about these changes because if something doesn't work you can always switch it off again and it will not hurt anyone and it opens ways for for a prototyping for a b testing so uh, really uh, try it and that's it uh, from me today for you so if you have any questions i guess we have a couple of minutes or you can catch me later thank you feels like a quite expensive kind of prototype to do, so do you still do some more low-tech before you go into the stage? Or do you always start by quite 
you want to crack the code? So. Uh, Actually, it, it depends on the thing we, we are trying to uh, d design and, and develop. For, for some features, and I guess we did about four or five features this way, sometimes we get quite straight from the idea to the, to the development because, uh, because it's really quick and dirty programming. You, you approach it like a hackathon project. It's not so expensive. Because it's like a day or two days of work for, for a dev developer if the feature is simple. So it's, it's not so expensive as it sounds. So, but of course, for, for the other features, we, we have also different kind of prototypes. Designers do some sketches first. So th there are features that got a lot more design attention before they, they go to this stage. So it, it, it always depends on the context of the thing we are developing. Yeah. No questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, one more. Um, so you were developing in the master branch, your features. Yeah. Um, what do you do when you have to roll it back? Do you just commit, you know, remove the code base and make another commit straight to the master branch? Uh, I'm not sure what do you mean by rolling back because uh, because the feature is hidden behind the feature flag, it doesn't break anything right. until it is enabled. So. Uh, yeah, if the experiment fails and we decide, okay, we have this feature flag and we don't want to enable it for anyone because it breaks, at some point we decide, okay, let's remove it from the code base because it's just a mess. So <laughs> even with the feature flags that are uh, successful, at, at some point when the feature is released for all of the users, we decide, okay, all of the users have this feature, we don't need this feature flag anymore, so we remove the, the code about this feature flag. So, so we, the, the list of the feature flag doesn't grow incrementally. It's, uh, we remove the code that, that, that is not needed. Yeah. All right. Thank you.